Well, good morning and welcome to Dronfield Baptist Church. My name is Andy Gore and welcome to this week's worship. Last week I had lots of great comments about the tree and the story behind the tree. I've got another question for you in a moment. Firstly, is that Life Dronfield, our lo- one of our local ch- church-based charities here, we are having an online auction, and if you'd like to join in for one of those, maybe a special gift for someone who may not always be the easiest person, or maybe an extra style of treat. And also, last, this coming week, is the end of the collection for the boxes for those who are vulnerable, which we're giving out for this Christmas time, this Friday, the 27th. If you have anything, please bring it by then. So this week, let's back, get back to lighting candles. The first week, when I lo- we spoke about light, and so I began lighting candles, or why we have light candles at Christmas time. The second week, we had plants, and so we had holly, we had ivy, we had mistletoe, and of course the poppy as well, being Remembrance Sunday. Last week, we had the tree. And the story of Boniface. And this week, well, the candle represents something of which there were over 900 million sent last year. Any ideas what the ritual might be? Well, it's all to do with these. Let's put that there out of the way. 900 million of these were sent last year, Christmas cards. And uh, they speak about and they remind us of all those who we love to keep in touch with, especially at Christmas time. Now, the story is, is that why are there robins on Christmas cards in our country? They have little, they have nothing to do with the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus. Why do we have robins? Press pause, the pastor, if you want to do a bit exploring, or I will tell you now. Well, the reason is, is that the cards, Christmas cards, came out in Victorian times. They were, came out at the same time as cheap posters, a penny, a penny, the penny black postage stamp. And The reason why robins are around is because Victorian postmen used to wear bright red waistcoats and they looked a lot like robins. And of course, with people delivering more around Christmas time than usual, so people saw postmen a lot more than they were used to. And just one of those things that their nickname, robins, as postmen, became part and parcel of our Christmas heritage. So there we are. That's why we have Robins. Let me put that there, out of the way, and I say, there we go, card. And oops, Daisy, a big thank you to Charlie for all his hard work in painting that for me. We're going to sing a song of worship, sing, Great is Thy Faith. As we're thinking today about the life of the Spirit in faithfulness. So let's sing this song celebrating God's faithfulness to us day by day by day. So let's sing together.
pray together as we come together. We pray our loving God that we may know afresh this day your great faithfulness to us. We thank you that you are a faithful God. You describe yourself as reliable, as constant, as consistent. You're faithful to who you are and you are faithful to to your promises. We thank you that as we are approaching the time of Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. So we remind ourselves his birth is a sign of your faithfulness to your promises in your covenant, that you would do something, you'd bring the king who would be the means by which your promises would be kept. And as we come towards Christmas, so as we give gifts, as we celebrate in all the rituals of Christmas, in the sending and in the receiving of cards, we do so because they remind us of the great gift of Jesus, the sign of your faithfulness. We thank you, our loving God, that Jesus was faithful even unto death, faithful to your call on his life, faithful to his vocation of why he came. And we bless you, Father God, that in your raising him from death to life, you showed your faithfulness to your intent and purposes of love and of salvation. We thank you again for the gift of your spirit who stirs us within, reminding us day by day of your goodness and your faithfulness. Forgive us, Father God, when it's at times hard to truly believe this. We wrestle, we struggle with this. Help us, we pray, to always return back, having learned that, yes, even in the midst of difficulties and of storms, you are our faithful God. And we ask all this in your Son's name. Amen. We come to sing two songs of response to our faithful God. They are Amazing Grace and I Am Not Alone. We sing these songs. Both songs speak of God's faithfulness in action, faithfulness in love. So let's sing together.
You will never leave me. I am not alone. 
Our reading today is going to be read by Marilyn. It is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. Thank you, Marilyn. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory, the future glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. How do you open your Christmas cards? Yeah, you, I don't know how many you might receive, but how many do you oh how, how do you receive them? I have at home a letter opener that I bought on honeymoon. We were in Brighton for our honeymoon and I bought this bright yellow plastic paper knife for all the postage that I would receive. Of course, that was donkeys years ago when e for even emails were really around. And so I received more electronic than paper mail, but I still like to use a paper. It has a nice feel to it. We also, Julie and I, we open our cards, we sit together in bed over coffee, and we like to open them slowly to treasure each and every one of them. Because the giving of cards and the sending of cards, the heart is, is about being a blessing. We write and speak about love. We want people to be blessed. But also, we receive them slowly because we want to, we wait for the Christmas letters. I don't know how you think about letters, whether you write letters. I love, I write our family letter for Christmas. We've been doing it for about 20 years, 25 years. I love writing the letter. And we love receiving letters and the variety of styles that the people who write to us have. There's one lady called Sheila, and Sheila, is, or rather, was a midwife. She was a midwife for our two younger children who were born at home. So you have that much more closer tie with them. And we, great friend with Sheila, and we love, she now lives in Cornwall, retired, 
and we love hearing her news. A good friend of ours, Bruce and Lois, they are, he's a minister in East London, and the Stokes, they are the epitome of being concise. Their letters are really, really short, but you never feel as if you've been shortchanged, as if they've rushed it. They are wonderful in they, how they write. And our final letter we'd like to receive is from a good friend of ours called Diane. Diane was on the same mater maternity ward as Jilly, and uh, we love to hear her news because her news is always so grand, it's so exciting. It's such filled with drama, it was like a soap on paper. And we just love to catch up. And of course, receiving the letters means you catch up on a flavour. You rejoice in the ups and the downs of the life that they describe in their letters. But above all, we like to read about the signs of hope. The signs of expectation that however this year has been, and of course, I think for all the letters of 2020 will mention the C word, won't they? However this year has been, we love to hear how those who have hope when they write their letters. And of course, this is what Romans chapter 8 is all about. This is a letter that is breathless. It's breathless in the anticipation of the height and the length, the breadth and the depth of the hope that we have in Jesus. To use the language that Marilyn read, it's the hope of like when a child has been born, of the mother who groans in childbirth, as Paul used that metaphor here. But yet when the child's born, there is the joy. Or as we are thinking about this time of year, of that child, that particular child born over 2,000 years ago, from whom the birth of that child, of course, is the source of all hope which Christmas celebrates. Now, my role in writing our family Christmas cards, you could say, is quite minimal. In fact, I just write the letter. Now, before you nag and say, Andy, I'm sure you ought to sit with Jilly and help her write the uh, 120 cards or so. Well, I have tried, but the thing is, when Jilly sits down writing cards, it feels like holy ground. You take your shoes off, you tread the ground with not anticipation, with, with caution, with uncertainty, because I do get things wrong. And every now and then either we miss people off because I've been helpful, because Jill's assumed I've done their card, or someone gets two cards because I thought I was doing that card as well. So you see at times why Jilly doesn't mind too much. I will offer again, and she might roll her eyes. She might go... Thank you, darling. Great letter. But we'll wait and see. Well, under your feet is holy ground. Look down. Under your feet, there is holy ground. But the thing is, can you hear what the ground is saying? Can you hear yourself, what you are saying? Can you hear what God is saying? Because here in this, these verses, that Marilyn read, we hear about creation, we hear about the spirit, we hear about ourselves doing one thing in common, and that is groaning. We groan all together. In verse 18 that Marilyn read, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. The reason why we groan is so often rooted to the sorrow of suffering. In the first century, when Paul wrote to these Christians in Rome, they had just been through a time of intense persecution, most likely from Claudius. They had understood the nature of being hunted for their faith, the nature of suffering for their faith, the nature of being hungry, the nature of suffering grief. 
And of course, in the 21st century, there is no difference. That same sense of suffering, if you read various people like Open Doors or the Barnabas Fund, you can read about the suffering that millions of Christians have as their daily lot in life. And think for us, is that this suffering, this desert experience that we've been speaking about this year about, means that life at times is an endurance. When we go through difficult times, like say, even this time of the pandemic, of the anxiety, the worry, the uncertainty, is that these things are demanding. It's emotionally and mentally, spiritually draining. And it's a challenge to our hearts of what we feel is so easy to become hard-hearted. It challenges our mind of how to understand the thing. It challenges our discipleship, our following of Jesus. And above all, it roots itself in the question, is God really faithful? In times of suffering, of difficulty, it's easy to ask that question, not tritely, not simplistically, because actually we wrestle as we should. But when we groan like this, as we all do, we must remind ourselves of the broader, the bigger, the wider canvas behind us. Because in times of difficulty, it's very easy to idolise our suffering. It becomes the all-consuming thing, the thing we only ever think or talk or pray about. Our God becomes shaped and moulded as when he can't do suffering, can't help us. Or otherwise, we trivialise it. We say, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, we we get on with it. And uh, we say it's of no matter, of no consequence. But actually what's important is that we need the bright light, like these candles, like the lights on the tree, the bright light of God's covenant purposes in Jesus. That's what God's faithfulness means. He is faithful to his covenant and faithful to how these promises are lived out, were fulfilled in Jesus and now are being fulfilled in us. That's what God's faithfulness, his righteousness is all about. And the breadth of this canvas is like in verse 20. Paul says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. Also, verse 21. Here, Paul is looking back, echoing upon the language of Genesis 3, the time when creation was subjected by God to futility but in this moment of subjection it groans and that's why creation groans it groans because it's subject to futile things but now also because of Jesus it groans in a new sense it groans for the second Adam to fulfill all these purposes for the second Adam to deal with All the disaster, the sorrow, the suffering, the difficulties of life that it speaks about. That is what creation groans for. It groans for a second exodus when all will one day be well. When God will fulfill his covenant purposes. Because these groans of creation also echo the groans of Israel in Exodus chapter 1 in Egypt when they were slaves it says they cried out to God God heard and he sent Moses it speaks of the groaning of that mother that young mother in that stable in Bethlehem giving birth to her firstborn son it echoes the groans of those women who gathered around that tomb, having seen their best friend killed upon a cross, having seen him anointed and buried, a stone rolled and sealed, and they groaned because it looked as if that was the end. And when they went back on that Easter Sunday morning, their groans were transformed into amazement, into terror, it says, because the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? 
And we have here also, finally, the groans of the Spirit. The Spirit groans in creation, but also groans in us. For us to catch a sense of this yearning, this desire for God to be at work. We groan, we plead with God to come and fulfill, to be faithful to his promises. We yearn for God to shed his glory over us and on and over all creation. And what that means is when we will receive in ourselves the fullness of his promises, as it says here, the fullness of our adoption, also the fullness of our redemption, another great Exodus term, when we will one day in our resurrection become fully like Jesus, fully made into his image. Now, behind me, does that make you groan? Does Do Christmas cards make you groan? Now, every year we do groan because we go through the list of those who sent us cards last year. And we go, actually, this person hasn't sent us a card. So we scratch them off the list. And then a card from them arrives normally really, really late. And so we have to put a first class stamp. I know, shock, horror. Have to rummage around for the letter. Often rummage around for a card because we buy just enough cards. So we groan. But we don't mind groaning because actually we are glad also that we've heard from them. We've had a letter from them. But that groaning, oh, I can't believe I've got to do another card. Or rather, in my case, Jilly has. In verse 25, this is what Paul says. Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Paul isn't groaning, going, oh, I can't believe it. His groan is the exact opposite. There is a joy. There is an excitement. Groaning isn't, uh, but groaning is, oh, come, Lord. The groaning is of excited anticipation and expectation because we know God is faithful. He is faithful to his covenant, so we're excited as we groan. He is faithful in Jesus, so we are excited as we groan. He is faithful because he is at work in this strange world we live in. That does not stop God at work. He is still at work. So we groan with expectation. God does not fail. So we groan with this joyful anticipation, expectation. God is a God of hope. So we groan with joy because we know he does not let us down. We groan not because we despair. We groan because we dare to hope. We dare to believe that God is faithful. Despite all that we see or hear, God is faithful. Despite these signs of great environmental crisis, which should drive us to despair, we hope because we seek to be the means by which this crisis is averted, but also we know that one day all will be made new. We have hope because, yes, we see evil all around us in all its shades, yet we do not despair because evil does not have the last word. We have hope because despite this rampant pandemic that we see all around us, all these questions, when will it finish? Yet we have hope. We have hope despite all of my and your faults and failings, our flaws. We've got plenty of them, yet we do not despair because God is faithful. He is reliable. And we dare to hope because today... That sense of what we receive. We received the first fruits. We received, if you like, one gift from under the tree. But we know that there are more to come. We receive this gift knowing that they will come to us. So we receive this gift of the Spirit. 
because we know he is a guarantor of all that we will one day receive. We know his fruit within our lives. And have you noticed the sermon titles? They speak about living the life of the spirit, living the spirit of life in joy, in peace, self-control, faithfulness. They are all fruit of the spirit. And as we receive the spirit, so we know within us, we are loved by God. So we know that we are, we can hope in God. So we know that we are saved by God. So we know we have a future with God. Paul encourages us to root ourselves in this hope. Trust in this God. He says, for now there is no condemnation. Back into verse one. So please Think about this. For those who are part of this church, for those of you who know Jesus, renew your hope, your confidence. When you are threatened with despair, when it feels too much, which is often so true, look to Jesus. Put your hope in him. For those of you who may not know Jesus as Saviour, as Lord, then put your trust in him. Yes, look at all your faults, your failings, but look to the one who, who gave himself, that you may have hope. Because that is what this season, these lights, cards, that what they speak about, the hope that we have in Jesus. We come to pray. I'd like you to pause the pastor. I'd like you to pray. I've mentioned the ecological environmental sort of crisis, the pandemic. I've mentioned evil in its broadest sense. I've mentioned Myself, yourself. So please pray for these things, for anything, for anything. Please pray in a groaning sense, but pray also in hope that God, he does hear our prayers, but that God will also answer our prayers. So let's come to pray. Please pause and pray for this world. We conclude our worship. I sing the song 10,000 Reasons by, so by Matt Redmond. A song he wrote very much has been used very much by people who have had times of extraordinary difficulty. They found in this song great hope. So let's join this in singing this song together as we sing this song of hope.
Conclude our draw our worship to a close by saying to him who is able to keep you from falling. He is able to keep you from falling. To Christ our King, our Saviour, may there be praise, be glory, be majesty and power forever and forever. May you be a person filled with hope this day. May that hope touch and change and continue to mould you because God is faithful. Have a great week in all that you do. I look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye and God bless. <laughs>